Hello, everyone, um, and uh, thank you for uh, coming to listen to my presentation today. Um, I am Dr. Mohamed Mayouf. I am a senior lecturer um, at Birmingham City University, specialized in digital construction, and uh, also the course leader for MSc Digital Construction, MSc Building Surveying with Facilities Management. I simply come from a civil engineering background, did a master's in project management, and my PhD was indeed in BIM, which is probably today's everybody's interest. Um, Today I'm going to be uh, talking to you about uh, a probably uh, an overly spoken on uh, topic, but at the same time still suffering from plenty of issues, obviously because of the nature of the projects within our industry, uh, which is the construction process or the execution phase at least. And um, I will be directly going through the BIM and AI side of it, as AI now is making a big, a big uh, or playing a big role in our industry indeed looking at the huge amounts of data and databases that we can use to optimize and make more informed decisions. So I do hope you enjoy the presentations and at the end I will leave some time of course for answering your questions when they are available. Um, I am also a visiting professor at Ziggurat Institute of Technology which is based in Barcelona, Spain. Um, so today the outline will be really going um, over the construction schedule, you know, how it evolved and changed over time, which probably shouldn't be something any different to most of your knowledge. Um, I will then be moving on to what happened to construction scheduling process in itself. Then I will go uh, the more specific into the 4D BIM, which is really the center theme of today, you know, looking at um, scheduling within the merits of BIM, obviously. And uh, we will be looking at, you know, what has the industry achieved as well as what did we manage to achieve or succeed in. Um, next, I will go into the AI, which is another interesting angle of today. Uh, next, I will go into the potential of the dead later life data, which I will be talking about later and hopefully will be an area of interest for discussion later on. And finally, I will conclude with the future of uh, construction scheduling. So to begin with, I think construction scheduling, if we look at it principally and in its abstract conceptualization, it didn't start just like, you know, 50, 60, 100, 200 years ago. No, it started probably since the time they were building the pyramids. So you plan a process, you execute the process, you do mistakes, you modify the process, you, get, you then trial and error. Of course, the difference at the time between then and now, of course, they less chances to modify because a mistake back then would probably ended up killing somebody. And nowadays we know that, for example, when a risk or when a delay happen, the simple thing to do is apply modifications, extend or optimize the schedule, move on, move on, move on. So it was really construction scheduling in principle, a combination between time activities and the sequences. And then back in the 17th century, you know, the introduction of the bar chart came on which obviously later on advanced into PERT, CPM, and all these construction scheduling techniques, which most of our people, if not everybody in our industry, at least know or have heard of. So the time activity sequence, of course, was well combined or were added to with the process. And finally, people started even to add resources into it. And that's how construction scheduling advanced over time. Now, if we look at the automation side of it, of course, if we want to carry on the story, back from the 1900s, and, compare, compare, and here I'm comparing the construction scheduling with visualization itself, where we all know that probably until even nowadays, uh, we're still using hand sketches. And then the 2D CAD came on back from the 50s, which then advanced into 3D CAD and then rendered images. Scheduling, on the other hand, in principle, it did not change. So... The idea of using bar charts or, or critical path method really existed since over 100 years ago. What has changed? The automated side of it uh, has changed or has at least evolved. So now we started having more software applications to facilitate this. And of course, maybe the simplest one or the one at least that everybody would know of is Microsoft Project, which probably comes anywhere as part of the suite of Microsoft Office. But we also know that as the Power Project has, it already exists and in huge deployment within the industry. Primavera, which, is, which again has become probably one of the most advanced ones to be used currently within our industry and is being also employed into one of the largest infrastructure projects in Europe, which is the HS2. And of course, the introduction of BIM. 
Now, BIM did not came in, in, in principle back in 2010, uh, uh, you know, or so. It actually, as an idea, was introduced back in the 70s. But then following 2010, or probably a little bit before 2010, with the introduction of BIM, and because BIM had all the infrastructure to be introduced or invested from a technology point of view, as well as from a process point of view. And of course, the process people kept updating on it. And when past 1192 ISO 19650 documentations came on, they came as a way to structure and flourish that process. Now, back in 2010, or probably late years in between, I would say 2007, 2009, Information in BIM became represented by dimensions. So here, 4D is not the one that you actually experience in the cinema. 4D refers to the layer of information or dimension of information concerning scheduling. 5D, which is the fifth dimension concerning the dimension which relates to cost. And again, that 5D has changed over time in terms of the way that it was supposed to be understood as opposed to the way that it is being perceived right now. And the 6D, 7D, which again, 6D, 7D are being used interchangeably, you know, with uh, health and safety, oh, sorry, with, with sustainability, 8D is be, being used as health and safety and so on. Now, with construction scheduling, what happened? Now, if we look at the overall story of construction scheduling, and I did mean to actually go back to the basics in here because I want to put more emphasis on the data side of things. Scheduling in principle begins with tendering obviously you wouldn't schedule something unless actually you are going to be executing the project or have designed the project that you will be executing so here if we want to talk about a design and build let's say scenario which will start anyway with the with the fact that you're tending to get the project with the design potential way of you the way you're going to be executing it. you want that you want that contract and now it's time to actually plan how to execute it from the tendering, where do we proceed? We proceed, of course, to flourish the design as well as identify the project's key dates. And from there, we proceed into pricing work packages. And later on, what happened, the critical things start emerge. So the difference between pre-tendering when you present to the client potential way of executing it, now it's time to actually get to the level of detail or get to an appropriate level of detail because that's the time we're going to specify how actually this will cost and what are the potential associ potentially associated risks, potentially associated complexities that you need to tackle before you actually encounter. Methods of construction, we're talking about potential means to modify the original design and not modify the entire design, but identify how you will be executing it or what we refer to in our industry as the constructability. Methods of construction is how is, is highly influenced or highly influences procurement side of things. And that's why you see there's always that continuous feedback loop between methods of construction, procurement and work packages, which is another layer of complexity within, our, within, within construction scheduling and construction schedule, which is the center theme of today. Many companies, maybe many, not many know this, but of course, to those who are in industry, they would know, they would know this for sure. Every company, or at least we're talking about large contractors, for instance, in the UK, tier one, tier two contractors, they do have a template program. What do I mean by template program? There are some typical activities that exist almost in 90% of the schedule. So why do you need to recreate them every time? And sometimes these activities are inputted in a certain way. You need to modify the terminology side of things, or you may need to modify the way that they have been arranged. But they are present. In addition, what happens in the template as well, you've got the company's logo, you've got anything related to providing value back to the client, anything that can notify and make the project managers aware of what's going on. So these are all exist in the template program. Um, for DBIM and going back into, now going, uh, sorry, deeper into what for DBIM in particular, because it is the one that really focuses on the scheduling side of things. What has the industry achieved? Now, I do remember personally when I did the very first uh, 4D BIM project for one of the oil and gas plants in the Middle East back in 2012, I do remember that 4D scheduling back then was more a visual tool to represent how the construction process or how the construction will be executed or conducted on site. Now, of course, 
at the, at the time, to me, 4D was very flat because the original function of it was to support better coordination and detect mistakes proactively before they happen or detect even issues before they happen. So 4D, when it started almost, I would say around early 2000s as an idea even before it became more associated with BIM. It used to be referred to as 4D model or 4D CAD because it was simply using visual information or visual representation of objects, connecting them with a gun chart to simulate the construction process. So the whole function at the time was visualization and that included process simulating, later on in advanced to even simulating workspace logistics as well as workspace conflicts. Following 2010, when the idea about 4D BIM started becoming more flourished and more importantly, associated with BIM. Now, the difference here is the difference here is that we're talking about more information coming from multiple stakeholders into the model. And of course, that cannot just include visualization, but more importantly, the collaboration side of things. So we're talking about coordination of the schedule, we're talking about design coordination, and we're talking about potential environmental planning and management. Probably around late 2015, maybe late 2014, it cannot be very accurate date-wise, but with the emerge of Open BIM or Cloud BIM, now there's a huge amount of data being stored. Now, not to engage computing at this early stage in the presentation, but the automation side of things became much more robust compared to the previous years. So we're not talking about only collaboration and using the data provided by different stakeholders into common data platform. But more importantly, we are actually talking about automating decision and automating aspects related to scheduling because we've got a huge amount of data, okay? And that is supposed to be improving decision-making and data retrieval. Right at the same time or almost at the same era is the time where people started thinking about the application, of course, the idea is maybe it may have been represented before, but right at the time people started thinking about, oh, how can we integrate the use of big data or AI, artificial intelligence, as part of our industry? Of course, it's very difficult, even up until now, we are in 2022, and it's still very difficult because every project's specific data and requirements are quite unique and we cannot replicate the project exactly with the same circumstances. Now, have we managed to succeed in terms of 4D BIM scheduling? Of course, the simple answer to this is yes, okay? Definitely there's better coordination, more people are involved, there's a better collaboration definitely between BIM coordinators or managers as well as planning engineers or, schedule or scheduling experts. So, if we want to put this in a nutshell, and here I'm trying to come from a socio-technical perspective, okay? Not to sound too theoretical, but from a construction planner's perspective, 4D BIM has definitely came as a better way to improve collaboration and the placing of classic techniques. From a technology point of view, now we have new roles that have that has that have emerged in our industry, and that that, that those those are the 4D coordinator or 4D modeler or 4D manager, okay? They brought in the automation, the capabilities and function. And of course, we've got the combination of the two in order to optimize process. Now, in that sense, okay, what we were able to do, planners were still were aiding the scheduling. There is still a lot to play in terms of this, of the auto, in terms of the automation in terms of improving the capabilities and function of a lot of the software applications that support the function of 4D BIM, as well as there isn't much evidence to show that complexity was tackled. What have we lacked in all these intersections? Data and information definitely remain as a huge issue because what I'm talking about is how data is being produced right from before the design advanced during the design, multiple design stages to the construction process until it becomes information to be used on site and then progress later on to, uh, to, the, to, to the client or the handover stage. The quality and time is still we are suffering a lot and embedding requirements that we as construction planners want within the te within 4D technology is still lack. Now, a comparison here 
between the two. And of course, one thing I forgot to mention here quickly is that this is a representation by activity-based scheduling, which is the classic base scheduling. And the classic base scheduling is basically using the original gun chart, coupling it with the 4D BIM object or with the, sorry, with the 3D object to create a 4D BIM simulation and just using the 4D simulation or 4D BIM merely for visualization purposes and process monitoring. On the other hand, one of the things I discussed back in 2019 in the CRB World Congress was the potential shift into object-based scheduling. So we create 3D BIM or 3D models, we export them from uh, from the platforms that they were created within, whether Archicad or whether Autodesk or whatever, whatsoever. And what we do is we start automating the schedule out of these objects. One of the things that actually, unfortunately, ended up uh, becoming a shortfall in doing that is the fact that, again, data and information is still lacking because how can you reliably ensure that everything presented in a 3D model is appropriate to do a schedule. Bearing in mind that a lot of the activities in a gun chart are actually not represented in 3D models. So here technology is more aiding the process and decisions are more informed by technology. And then the construction planners are coming in to modify things. So instead of doing the work, we are reworking the work. The middle thread line between the two is that data and information still remain the complexity. Why am I saying this? Um, because with lack of understanding data and lack of understanding information life cycle, how it comes all the way from design phase to the construction phase, we are not able to achieve optimization. A lot of the schedules, and this is one of the things I did talk about in one of my previous talks a few months ago, that how can we optimize construction schedules so that they become more achievable? And people are actually saying, oh, we can't really do such thing unless we have full understanding of data and information life cycle. And this is the thing that I want to also introduce today in my presentation, which is the application of dead data and live data. This is actually a representation originally coming from, um, of course, this was created based on Laurie Koskella's work in 2000, identification of different construction task requirements. So every construction task would compose or at least be composed of equipment, machinery side of it, people side of it, design data side of it, on-site data, time scheduling and materials as well as risks. How are we doing that? Now, with looking at each of these categories I just mentioned, if we just try to look at it abstractly from as a graphical data, numerical data, and textual data. Construction schedules, if we want to actually go back to its basics, they were mostly they were a combination of numerical data represented by period or cost, which is which is you know as a consequence of resources, as well as textual information, which is the naming of the activities or any other notes on it. The graphical data came as a result of you know, for the event technology, which is the engaging of the 3D objects. Now, what we are lacking is a coordination between all these three types of data. So what we have created by 4D BIM technology isn't strong in principle, but the way that we are dealing with it is still using the basics of scheduling. In this instance here, as, I'm, as you can see in the slide, every data is abstracted into a numerical data, graphical data, and textual data. Why is that? Or why would we do such thing? Now, by doing it in that way, what we are achieving, I'll go back, I'll, I'll again proceed with the slide shortly. What we are able to achieve, very simple. By categorizing these different types of data, we are able to create more databases, okay? Or a database that actually is required or database that can, we can say, yes, we can actually apply that numerical database or textual database or graphical database into optimization if something arises. So let's put it actually an instance in here. If we want to actually optimize or not, not even, not, let's not even use the term optimize. If we want to design a roof, for example, okay? By designing a roof, what are the critical data in this particular project that we can use? Well, we have a database that combined the use of 250 roofs back within the same country or similar context. 
and it was advisable that using these settings or these specifications to actually use this. So here we are actually giving more emphasis into the data itself and less emphasis into just the fuss of using technology. In terms of using AI, okay, or artificial intelligence as part of scheduling, a lot of the issues lie really in the data science side of things. And this is actually an extract from a latest study or a study back in 2021, okay, which is not really a long time ago, just we're talking about last year. Um, that, that study in particular, actually it was 2022, apologies. Um, the construction scheduling and AI, if you look at data in here or data sources, the study identified that in a BIM model, in order to actually improve the way that construction schedules are being managed, we're looking at data sources coming from semantic BIM data, site photographs, design and construction BIM models, historical resources, construction schedule, IoT sensors. In principle, this is not wrong. But what we are falling again in, in what is the trap that we are falling in here? It's the same. If we look at site photographs, we are talking about graphical data. How much of graphical data am I using in here for my project to optimize a schedule? How much numerical data am I using in order to optimize my schedule? And this optimization really should come at almost midway or towards the end of a design stage where things start to become more flourished. And then we can actually, for instance, estimate times better, put contingency plans better, or put forward contingency plans better, and more importantly, tackle unpredicted risks that unfortunately gets to be repeated in different construction schedules. Now, some of you may actually say that, oh, the same thing has been discussed over and over. Yes, but the difference between back then and now is that now we have means to store the data, means to develop databases. But if we keep developing databases that is built on different conceptualization by different construction planners, we're not going to be able to get anywhere near optimization because data will remain unstructured, databases will remain unstructured, and then we are only going to be doing it like pick and choose. If I want to achieve a sustainable house, for example, I will go and get a database that actually provide me data on, for example, thermal conductivity of walls. And then that's it, because that's the only database that is available for me, and it does not get me access into anywhere else. Um, is the process too seamless? Of course, the, 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 the example I just talked about really represent uh, dead data in here. So construction schedules and AI what is that data? That data is da data that was created during the design phase and that is used as a base to create the construction scheduling data. And here we have, for example, graphical data about, for example, a column, the numerical data. We may not have specifications about that column, which is textual data that actually may become crucial later on. And when I talk about crucial later on, depending on the project, if it's a high-rise building, if it's a mixed use development, if it's in an airport, if it's in a prison, in a bank, the, the way that an object may be used in multiple contexts impose different considerations. So this is the dead data. And I call dead data is because sometimes data that is used for a particular purpose at a particular point in time, and then it's done. Live data, however, is how we can use data on site to optimize data again in the schedule. And here we have two sources of complexity. My presentation today is not coming to solve, a, to solve an issue, but really is a perspective to set into, to, to, so that different professionals can look into data from multiple perception. So earlier I talked about structuring data into graphical, textual, and numerical so that we can better achieve optimization and that comes from database outside the schedule. And we have live data, which is the circumstantial data coming from the site into the schedule to apply changes. And what we are doing in here, we are enriching the existing database, but also we have better understanding and predictability of potential live data that can change the schedule. In an infrastructure project, for example, like a railway, how 
would I predict it? Or how would I possibly pre predict it that there's a returning wall that will be in here? Fine. Now, there will be a returning wall nearby that railway. Excellent. Who should be notified of this? Are there any associated activities in the design that need changing or amending? Or will people find out about this later on? And that's the way that construction schedules should start to mature and understand because we have the availability of data. Okay? So graphical data in particular as part of live data coming from, from the site, as well as numerical data will be major key players to optimize our schedules. Um, and the whole idea now, of course, this, I'm concluding my presentation here. Now when you see technologies like blockchain, okay, which gives better, um, better traceability, blockchain is not only meant to, for example, go into, or technologies like blockchain is not meant to be used within the merit of privacy and security only as it's being used within the merit of computing or software engineering. No, in our industry, it can be used as a way of structuring workflows as shown in the front of you so that we have better traceability of things that we change. This is how we align different digital construction technologies into our industry to improve current processes or complexities within the current processes that we do. Okay? And that's the way we should be thinking about construction schedules. So it's about tracing data once created, the, multi the multitude of using that data, whether that data need changing based on historical data or relevant data, if available, and how that data might have possibly become changed or affected or impacted by live data coming from the site. Um, like I said, the amount of complexities really remain on optimizing construction workflows in order to respond to task requirements, because this is and unfortunately many of the issues that tackled are in this stage when we execute tasks are as a result of lack of understanding or underestimating the value of data and information. And um, nowadays I'm doing a project with the uh, BIM initiative, which is based on Australia, on optimizing a workflow towards 4D BIM itself. So it should be done hopefully by end of this year latest, early 2023, and it should be published and it's meant to come as a way of appreciating data and information and processes associated with data and information to optimize our construction schedules better. And the team is composable from multiple professionals from all over the world. Um, I do hope you enjoyed my presentation and I look forward for your questions. Thank you very much.